So we are in class live. My name is Dr. Kat Fleece, and we're going to start talking about the brain today. So if we take a look at the size of a brain, the size of the brain is essentially the same between a male and a female. Um, we tend to think that males have bigger brains, but that's not really true. We females tend to be smaller. So the brain size, if we compare it to the rest of the body, is always pretty much the same. All right, so keep that in mind. Another thing for you to keep in mind is that your brain is bilaterally symmetrical. What does the word lateral mean again? Referring to sides, sides right? So if we talk about bilateral, it means the two sides of the brain are the same, basically, if we say they're bilaterally symmetrical. In other words, when we cut a brain in half, the left side looks very much the same as the right side, looks the same. But when we look at the functions of the different parts of the brain in the left side versus the right side, there's a little bit of variation. I mean, there's still some symmetry when it comes to functions, but for instance, you're in most of us, our left side has language areas in it that the right side doesn't. So when we talk language areas, we're now talking about functional areas, and I'll, I'll explain this better as we go. Just to uh, reiterate terminology, you've, you've, you're pretty familiar with some of this um, already based on some of the questions you guys asked me last time, but let's just go over this just to be sure. Um, for instance, we will come across the term nucleus a lot, particularly when we talk about the central nervous system. Of course, the brain is part of the central nervous system. When we use the term nucleus in the central nervous system, whether it's in the brain or the spinal cord, we're not referring to the nucleus of a cell anymore. All right? We're looking at a collection of cell bodies as it's defined right here. So a collection of cell bodies inside of the CNS we refer to as a nucleus. Now when we go outside of the CNS, on the other hand, in the peripheral nervous system, we call it a ganglion. And you can see the endings right here as well. So nucleus becomes nuclei, ganglion becomes ganglia. Okay? If we look at a bunch of axons together in the peripheral nervous system, we'll call it a nerve. Remember how when we started to discuss the, the nervous system, I said, be careful with the use of the term nerve. A nerve cell is very different from a nerve, or a neuron is not at all a nerve. A nerve is made up of many, many axons of many, many cells, right? And nerves, we use the term nerves when we're looking at all of these axons bundled together in the peripheral nervous system. Now, when we're looking at bunches of axons all crammed together within the central nervous system, we call them tracts. So a tract is kind of like a nerve, but we're in the CNS this time. And then finally, when we get to just the CNS, we'll see that the CNS has white matter and gray matter. White matter has its color because it's full of myelinated axons. So therefore, you can already deduce from this that people who suffer from multiple sclerosis, we talked a lot about that last time, right? People who suffer from multiple sclerosis and they are beginning to see demyelination of their axons in their central nervous system, what are they losing? white matter, right? They're losing some of their white matter. So when these people have imaging done, they can see dark patches either in their brain or spinal cord or both, which is indicative of the loss of that white matter. Now the rest of the central nervous system where we do not see myelinated axons, instead we see primarily cell bodies with here and there some unmyelinated axons, that's going to have more of a grayish color, and so we call it gray matter. Okay? So make sure you know your terminology. That terminology, you'll be a bit lost. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to figure 12.3 here. 
to really carefully show you in the brain, if we take a nice little chunk out of the brain, notice that the very outer layer of this brain has a slightly darker color. That's what we refer to as the gray matter, all right? It's kind of a brownish gray, darker pink, while the white matter has a bit of a creamish color or sometimes quite white. And so we'll learn where exactly we find white matter versus gray matter. So if we look at an example of a tract versus a nerve, it gets very interesting with our optic nerve. So here you're learning about the name of what we call a cranial nerve, a nerve that originates from your brain, cranial referring to the brain. So when we're looking at the nerve that leaves the brain to go to our eyes, as I'm pointing to now, we're outside the central nervous system. It doesn't seem that way, but we're not in the brain anymore at this point. So that we refer to as the optic nerve. But once all of those axons continue inside of the actual brain tissue, we call it the optic tract. All right, so same thing really, but in different locations. As we've seen before, Structures get different names depending on where we are in the body. Okay, we're now going to do a little bit of embryology. We did that somewhat in the skeletal system. We're going to do quite a bit of embryology here when it comes to the central nervous system. And I like doing this to show you how amazing it is, how our brain forms and our spinal cord. Um, but also to come back to those three embryonic germ layers. Remember your ectoderm, your mesoderm, and your endoderm. Very good. So we're going to see that our central nervous system and most of our nervous system, um, actually, or all of our nervous system, originates from the ectoderm, which is kind of weird if you think about it, because you know, our nerves and our brain and our spinal cord, they're sitting pretty deep in our body. So somehow that ectoderm has to invaginate and become a deeper part of the embryo. So we're going to take a look at that. Now, this figure 13-2 is part of your book. I, um, I grabbed another figure from another OpenStax book. You know, you guys have access to all the OpenStax books for free. Uh, I think this is from their introductory biology book. I like this one a little bit better. So I'm going to focus on this one. So if we start, let's see here, how shall we explain this? So imagine that we have kind of a, an elongated embryo and we slice it and we're looking straight at it now. So right here, we're looking at part of that embryo. Let's go back for a second to the uh, no, I don't want to go back because it'll screw up the recording right now. But So try to imagine that we have this lengthy, this rather stretched out embryo at this point in time. We slice it uh, transversely, and we're now looking straight on to the cross-section, essentially. We now have our superficial layer here. That is the ectoderm. Can you guys see this okay? Because this is kind of small. I could blow it up. Do I need to blow it up or are we okay? You guys okay? Yeah? Okay, so these red circles that you see, those red cylinders, imagine that they're coming towards you in that elongated embryo. They're part of the mesoderm. And down the road, you'll learn what that not, not a cord is. We're going to focus on that ectoderm. And notice that part of the ectoderm right here in the purple we're already referring to as the neural plate. I know that um, those words are hard for you to see from where you're sitting, but it's called the neural plate. This is where the cells, the ectodermal cells, are going to start dividing a lot. So they're going to produce more of them, and the cells are going to start migrating. And next thing we know, we see this invagination occurring right here. Actually, I already have an arrow sitting there. Um, let me add this arrow more intensely like so. And let me switch colors. This would be better to use in red. There we go. So we start to see that that neural plate starts to invaginate. 
And at the same time, we do leave these greenish structures, these green sections of the ectoderm, um, still on the outside of our, on the periphery of our embryo. So those, if we go to our next figure, the third figure, notice what they do. So first off, the invagination in the purple is going to completely close off and we now form a tube. So this purple lengthy tube is going to actually form the central nervous system. These green little segments of the ectoderm, notice what they did, they slipped now in between the remaining ectoderm and the forming neural tube. So this green section here, this green flat uh, slab of cells came from the ectoderm right here. So they slipped in between the remaining ectoderm, the forming neural tube, as we call it now, and these greenish cells here we call neural crest cells, neural crest cells. They're going to form most of the peripheral nervous system. So they're going to form more of the, most of the peripheral nervous system. Well, the neural tube is going to mostly, or is going to form our central nervous system. That is our brain and our spinal cord. So am I saying that our brain starts out as a tube? Yes. It's easy for us to understand the spinal cord having the shape of a tube, isn't it? Because it is indeed this long tail dangling off the brain. Um, does the spinal cord have a cavity in it like is showing here? Yes. And that's where your cerebrospinal fluid sits. And even inside of our brain, we have cavities where cerebrospinal fluid sits. So this is a brief introduction to how we form our central nervous system and to some extent our peripheral nervous system. So it's showing you how it's the ectoderm that's responsible for forming the central nervous system. Now we can put some time stamps on this and this all already starts around day 19 of, or so of gestation. Day 19, that's pretty early on, isn't it? So that little embryo that is growing inside of you is already cranking away, trying to form that nervous system. So it goes fast. Um, it starts early and it moves fast. So on this slide, slide 9, I made some mistakes so in how I arranged the text. So I suggest that you follow what I'm saying here. So first of all, what I put in that square here, where it says the process of differentiation has three phases, that really should be the title that precedes the three phases. That is proliferation, migration, and differentiation. So in other words, you know, in order for that these cells that are part of the ectoderm to then make that neural tube, with where the cells slowly but surely start to become neurons, we need to go through some steps here. And the obvious first step is that we need to make many, many more cells, right? By means of mitotic divisions. And another way of referring to that is by calling it proliferation, right? To proliferate means to make more. Everybody with me? So we're first going to divide lots of cells, make more of them. And then they need to start migrating to their destination. You saw how the ectoderm layer invaginates, right? It pinches off to form the neural tube. You also have your neural crest cells forming. So lots of moving around. So there's migration involved. And then eventually these ectodermal cells have to start differentiating such that they become functional neurons. Initially, they'll be immature neurons, and we call them neuroblasts, right? And when they become neuroblasts, they actually have already become amitotic. Remember what that word means to differentiate. What does that mean again? We've learned that in the first week of school. 
What does that mean to differentiate? It means that cells become more and more specific in their tasks. They're starting to get locked into their tasks. And if we look at what happens to their genes, it means that some genes become shut off and other genes become really active so that they can actually carry out those very specific functions and those specific functions only, right? There's no point in your skin cells making hemoglobin, is there now? Hemoglobin is a protein. All proteins are coded for, for, for genes. Do your skin cells have the gene for hemoglobin? Sure, but that gene is not actively transcribed. There's no need for hemoglobin in your skin cells. So be sure that you do not forget the definitions that you were introduced to at the start of the term. So remember I said the differentiation or the formation of that neural tube in particular already starts at week 19, at, at day 19 after fertilization. When we now take a look at this first figure here on slide, <clears throat> excuse me, slide 10, we're starting to see something that isn't a straight tube anymore. This time we're starting to see bulges in the tube. As a matter of fact, we refer to this as the three primary brain vesicles. So we have a, a big bulge, a bulge in the middle, and then a smaller bulge, which then leads to where our spinal cord is forming. So these three bulges we call the three primary brain vesicles, and you need to know their names. So the names of these three primary brain vesicles are the forebrain, but of course you need to know it in Latin as well, so prosencephalon. Notice if you translate this, you see encephalon or cephalon. What does that always mean? Right, refers to brain, right? Or head. Pro, foremost at front, right? Then you have the midbrain or the mesencephalon, mes, meso meaning middle, and then the rhombencephalon, which is the hindbrain, and then that in turn leads into the spinal cord. All right. Notice our timestamp again, you guys. Notice that we're only at week three or four when we have formed our three primary brain vesicles. Now, these three primary brain vesicles are going to continue to differentiate. Give me a bear, bear with me here. To form the secondary brain vesicles in the fifth week of gestation. I don't need for you to memorize these five uh, secondary brain vesicles. But I do need for you to see secondary brain vesicles. I can't write and talk. I do need for you to see some major changes. Now we're starting to see these Mickey Mouse ears. See them? Those are going to form your two big halves of your brain. And so on and so on. These, these guys here on the side, those are going to be your eyeballs. So if we move this over a bit further, you now see what each one of the vesicles gives rise to. This is a slide that I will need for you to come back to after you've learned all these different names that make up the brain. Right now, they probably don't make a whole lot of sense to you. So what I'm trying to say is once you know all the parts of the brain, you need to come back to the embryology and go, which primary brain vesicle gives rise to the final parts of the brain, right? What does the prosencephalon give rise to? What does the mesencephalon give rise to? What does the rhombencephalon give rise to? Again, I'm not holding you accountable for the names of the secondary brain vesicles. And you'll also see that eventually these brain vesicles, which are these bulges in our tube, they're going to start bending or flexing upon themselves. And now we're beginning to see something that is sort of looking like what our brain might look like, right? So literally, we're seeing some flexing occurring with the tail end again being that spinal cord. So here this slide lists what parts of the brain are formed by which one of the 
primary brain vesicle. So be sure you come back to this when all these parts make sense. So let me introduce you now to the three major parts, I mean not the three, the four major parts, I'm sorry. The four major parts are as follows, and I try to color coordinate them. So we have the cerebrum, those are your two big mushroom caps, or mushroom cap halves, right, that we tend to easily recognize the brain by. Notice that not only did those secondary brain vesicles begin to flex upon them themselves, but notice too that they became very crinkly, right? Uh, literally, our skulls would not be able, be able to accommodate our brain if our brain didn't start to fold upon itself. That's literally what it has to do to be able to fit in our little skulls. And by doing that, there's a whole lot more surface area and a whole lot more room for nuance. So everything in the blue represents the cerebrum. And we're looking at a mid-sagittal section here of the brain, so you can assume that the other half also has a cerebral hemisphere. So your cerebrum consists of two cerebral hemispheres. Hemisphere meaning what? A half a sphere, right? Everything in the green, which is very deep within the brain, is referred to as the diencephalon. You see dangling off the diencephalon a gland that we've already talked about in the past, the pituitary. On the posterior aspect, oh, let's continue first with uh, what we see beyond the diencephalon. So if we go further inferior, beyond the diencephalon, we get to what we call the brainstem. And here they have three, they're showing the three parts of the brainstem. So this bright green, this turquoise color, and this purplish color are all collectively part of the brain stem. And then finally, we have this rather cauliflower looking structure called the cerebellum. So if you guys have had psychology, this should be all pretty easy. If you've never really studied the brain, it can get confusing. So make sure that you always indicate on your slides where is anterior and where is posterior. So the anterior portion is on the right side here. Posterior is over here. The cerebellum always sits posterior. Remember that. This, this cauliflower-shaped structure always sits posterior. And there's other things to look for. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time starting today with the cerebrum or the, the cerebral hemispheres. And all of these four major parts, remember the cerebrum, diencephalon, brainstem, and cerebellum, which I'm hoping you know by next time, all of them are made up of three subparts, right? So here we start with the cerebrum. It is also made up of three subparts. So they're listed here, the cerebral cortex, the white matter, and then a bunch of nuclei. Remember what a nucleus is? It's a collection of cell bodies. If we look at these different parts of the cerebrum, they're listed from most superficial to deepest. All right? So it is as if we were to, if we were to poke your brain, then we would first go through the cerebral cortex then we'd go through the white matter and eventually we'd, we'd hit those nuclei. We have subcortical nuclei and basal nuclei. And we'll talk more about these nuclei next time. So if we start out with the cerebral cortex, that is the outer layer. So remember, if we were to poke your brain, we would go through that most superficial layer and that is called the cortex. By the way, sometimes we use the term cortex as an adjective, and so you'll see it written as an adjective as cortical, right? We could talk maybe about the cortical part of the brain. Don't forget that. It's a pretty thin layer. It's only two to four millimeters thick. That's like, you know, an inch is two and a half centimeters. That's 25 millimeters. We're talking here about a tenth of an inch. That's pretty thin. But since it's so convoluted, the cerebral cortex, 
there is, it makes up a huge amount of your brain. Notice it makes up close to 40% of your brain. That's pretty impressive because all of these convolutions, all of these dips and bumps and dips and bumps, they're not just on the surface, they're way deep within the brain as well, as I'll show you uh, next time on some pictures. Now, when we want to quickly summarize the function of the cerebral cortex, it's probably the most important part of your brain when it comes to conscious functions of the brain. This is where you become consciously aware of what I look like. This is where you are consciously aware of what's happening outside there in the hallway. This is where you become consciously aware of what's going on in your environment. This is where you plan. This is where you judge. This is where you do your thinking, you guys. So I've given you many, many examples of functions that occur there. Your language, um, the way you communicate with one another, using languages all processed in the cerebral cortex, including memory storage, as well as understanding one another. So all, all of these are pretty high level forms of brain functions that our lower organisms, lower animals cannot per se do, or we don't think we can do them as well. So I'll stop here. We'll, function, we'll continue with this next time.